We're starting a new uh, sermon series today, and it's entitled The Ends of the Earth, uh, with an obvious reference to Acts 1 8, and that'll be our theme verse as we go through. Acts 1 8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. You know, for the most part, we understand this verse. Jesus commanded this to his disciples just prior to his ascension back into heaven. And, and this verse, along with the great commandment that we find at the end of the book of Matthew, Matthew 28, verses 19 to 20, Jesus commands his church, his people, into all the world with the gospel to be his witnesses, not only locally, but throughout the land and to the end of the earth, to the end of the earth. And they will be discussing taking the gospel and being witnesses to the ends of the earth. You know, we send out missionaries from here. You know, uh, one thing we do in the, uh, in the service, we do video uh, uh, the sermons. And, and how many of you all seen a sermon online? Not too many. There's been a couple. Okay. You know, it's, it's, you go to our website. They're actually posted on YouTube. You go to our website and you can click on it and you can watch the sermon online. And, and I, I just heard uh, about one person um, listening to our sermons online. Uh, who's at the end of the earth? Uh, David Collins. Y'all remember David. He's over in Japan. And I got word from him. He, he, he enjoys our services online. And so as I'm looking at our camera back there, I want to give a wave to Dave because he'll be watching. Uh, you know, we send people all over the world, military folks uh, deployed, uh, TDY. We send people all over. You know, we're international missionaries. Who knows where these boxes are going to be going to? Who knows? You know, Lee talked about it. You, you saw the video. Uh, 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 last couple of years, they've been going to Central Africa. Believe you me, you don't get much more into the earth than in the middle of Africa. And, and so when we send them out, we might not be able to go ourselves. But who knows who we're going to reach? A child, the family of that child, uh, and others. We are being witness to the ends of the earth and as these shoes boxes go out you know and that makes us uh, international missionaries by the way but I also presupposes presupposes that we are missionaries right here at home right here at home right where God has placed us today we're going to be discussing who are the lost I have to apologize for the bulletin. My English wasn't very good. Who is? It's who are. But uh, who are the lost? And why reaching the lost is important. Turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. We're going to be looking at those first 10 verses. And these are uh, familiar parables that Jesus teaches. Familiar parables. Luke 15, verses 1 through 10. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Verse 1. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, verse 4, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you, likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Verse 8, or what woman, 
having ten silver coins. If she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may we rejoice in all those who come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Sinners who have come repented. And Lord, uh, may we be aware of the joy that it brings you. And Lord, may we be faithful and bring in joy to you as you have sent us out to be your witness. And you have charged us with the gospel. Lord, open our hearts, our minds, our understanding to these parables this morning that we might understand your very heart and wanting sinners to repent and the rejoicing that you do when they do come. Lord, we pray all of this in Jesus' holy name, and may he be glorified in, 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 in this place today. Amen. Amen. I read a story the other day. It was interesting. It was a story about a, about a guy. He, he prayed this prayer every morning. He prayed, Lord, if you want me to witness to someone today, please give me a sign to show me who it is. Well, one day he found himself on a bus in town. He lived in the city. And, 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 and this bus, as it's heading towards his home, a big guy, a big burly man came and sat next to him. The bus was nearly empty, but this guy sat down next to him. And, and this timid Christian, he was anxious for his stop to come up so he could exit the bus. But before he could get too nervous about this guy, this big guy, he burst into tears and began to weep. He cried out with a loud voice. He says, I need to be saved. I'm a lost sinner and I need the Lord. Won't someone tell me how to be saved? And he turned to the man and he said, can you show me how to be saved? And that man sat there and, and he prayed, Lord, is this a sign? <laughs> You know, the fact is, some of us are like that. We've got to be hit over the head in order to witness for an opportunity. You know, I, I have learned over the years, when, when, when I feel the call on God to witness to somebody, it's only because the Lord went ahead of me and prepared a heart to hear. That's right. And so we need to be faithful in witnessing. We, we, we shouldn't be hesitant to witness. We, but we tend to resist these opportunities to spread the gospel. As James read earlier, you know, uh, we, we need to be careful about warning people. We are charged with warning them. The Pharisees and the scribes were like that. Let's look at those first two verses that we read. Luke 15, 1 and 2. It says, Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew him, drew close to Jesus to hear him. You know, tax collectors and the sinners mentioned in the Bible, they knew they were sinners. They knew they were outcasts. They knew. But you know, Jesus had words of hope, and they drew near to hear him. The, 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 the uh, Pharisees and the, and the scribes didn't like that. He says, then the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. You know, the Pharisees and scribes, if you look through the Gospels, Jesus really never had a kind word for any of them. And these were the holy men of the day. And they were accusing Jesus of associating with the wrong kind of people. In fact, uh, there was a... A rabbinic, a, a saying among rabbis, which came later, uh, that said, let not a man associate with the wicked, not even to bring them to the law. And that pretty much sums up their attitude. We don't have anything to do with the lost of the world. 
interesting because didn't you know we go back in the Old Testament and I remember as we're doing the Old Testament survey and back in Exodus God called Israel to to be uh, the witness to the world, to be the missionaries to the world, to be, uh, uh, to be the priest to the world around them. So Jesus answered him in verse 3, he says, So he spoke this parable to them, saying, in answering these accusations, Jesus speaks three parables. Now we're only going to look at the first two. The last parable is about the prodigal son, or in my Bible it's, it's called the parable of the lost son. We're talking about people who are lost today. These three parables, we're not going to go look at the prodigal son today, but we're just going to look at the first two. But, but all three parables centers around God's concern about the loss of the world and with the repentance of sinners. The theme of these parables is the joy in heaven over the lost being found. The point of these three stories is that God receives real joy and satisfaction when he sees sinners repenting, whereas he receives no gratification from the self-righteous Hypocrites, those who think they have no need of repenting. And they're too proud to admit their wretched sinfulness. Their wretchful sinfulness. You see, the, the, the parables reveal the very heart of God. And this is what I hope to uncover this morning, is the heart of God here. Do we view... Do we view the lost as Jesus views the lost, as God views the lost? You see, these parables, and some people will take them and say, these are, these are about backslidden Christians who have lost their way. No, uh, we're reading too much into it. We've got to be careful that we don't turn these stories into complete allegories and assign uh, people and things. We, we need to look at the big picture here. We need to understand what's being conveyed. And, and, and otherwise, if we turn it into an allegory, we might miss the main message. Verse 4, uh, Jesus goes on and says, What man of you? I like the NIV, and it says, Supposing one of you, talking to, uh, to the Pharisees. Supposing one of you. He says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? Now, we're not going to get wrapped up. Well, what about the ninety-nine in the wilderness? Who's watching them? Let's, let's, let's focus on the one that's lost here. One lost sheep. Now, depending upon who you are, if you're an economist, you're, you're a bean counter and you're counting up numbers, you would look at and say that one sheep out of a hundred. You know, in businesses, a 1% loss is usually pretty acceptable. A 1% loss. And they would say, just write it off. Write off that 1% and move on. But that 1% has great value before God. Now, let's skip down. Let's look at the lost coin for a second. The woman with the lost coin. Verse 8 says, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not like a, light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. The houses that they lived in were generally windowless and with low doors. And even in the in middle of the day, the house is dark. So she lights a lamp and she sweeps the dirt floor. A, a coin that is lost in such a house is not easy to find. It, it's interesting, some of the commentators will say uh, ten coins would a lot of times make up a headband that the woman would wear. And this would have been given to her on her wedding day. And, and it was kind of like a wedding ring. And so she had this headband and all of a sudden to lose one coin out of it, it would be devastating to her. It's like having a ring with some diamond sets and all of a sudden you notice one diamond had popped out. It, it's valuable. It's not so much as the diamond itself, but what it's a part of. Other commentators will say, well, this must have been a poor woman and it was part of her life savings. Either way, either way, the loss is real. 
is a loss is real, and she will not accept a 10% loss. It is valuable. Every coin is valuable to her. But let's stand back and take a look for a second. Let's consider the one lost sheep and the one lost coin. Both were not where they're supposed to be. If we're lost, we're not where God wants us to be. And the world is full of people not where God wants them to be. And so, and, and so uh, the whole world is lost and we need to understand God's desire for it. Now look at the sheep and the coin again. Both of them did nothing to be found. It is God that goes looking for them. God goes looking. I praise the Lord. God found me. Got a hold of me one day. They did nothing to be found. The shepherds searched and the woman searched. And the Pharisees were shocked. Were shocked to hear that God searches for lost sinners. That every person is valuable to God. You see, throughout the Bible... Throughout the Bible, if we, we would just look at scriptures critically, we would see that God has come for them who are lost. The whole reason for Jesus is coming is to save those that were lost. God came searching for sinners right from the very beginning. Think back to the Garden of Eden for just a second. You know the story. Genesis 3, verses 8 to 9. And it says, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They already ate the forbidden fruit. They, they had done wrong, and they knew it. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? God came looking. Now, we need to realize God knew exactly where they were. Uh, the problem is, Adam and Eve had no clue where they were. And isn't that true about the loss of the world? Simple man does not know where he is. The Pharisees and the scribes, they were self-righteous, but they had no clue where they were. You see, God does not settle for a 1% loss or a 10% loss. He goes after all. In Matthew 18, this is the equivalent, very similar story here. Matthew 18, verse 14. Uh, uh, Jesus says, even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. It is not the will of God that any should perish. You see, God's grace has appeared to all men. Titus 2 verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. God has appealed to all. The problem is people don't take God up on his offer. You see, I don't think God condemns people as much as people condemn themselves because they've rejected God's free offer of salvation. And just as James read earlier, Ezekiel 33, verse 11, Say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And what's, God, what's God's desire here? We're here in the very heart of God. His desire is that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? You know, we're showing death and we're showing life. Your choice. And the surprisingly, uh, the number of people who decide to choose death. Now granted, the devil dresses it up a little more fancy than that. If we had death staring at, at our face. But, but you know, it's often camouflage. You know, go for the gusto. We talked about that last week. What is his will? What is God's will for the masses? And how does the masses respond? I've used this verse quite often, and I'm going to use it again. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some, some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Notice how repentance is central here. We've got a world that will say, I believe but they still live the old life. Repentance is an integral part of salvation. Uh, you, the, the world believes. The devils believe and tremble. James chapter 2. 
repentance is central. A person can't just simply say, I believe. It must be a genuine turning towards God and away from sin. People condemn themselves for rejecting the grace that God has shown to them. Has shown to them. Rejection is evident by the failure to repent. When one sheep is lost and is found, or the one coin that was lost and it was found, or one sinner repents, there's going to be rejoicing. There's going to be rejoicing. And with the fine, there will be rejoicing, both for the woman and for the shepherd. Let's go back and look at those verses. Luke 15, verses 5 to 6. And when he had found it, he laid it, laid the lamb on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. When someone comes to Christ, we need to be rejoicing and bringing our friends into it. Uh, Verse... uh, Chapter 15, verse 9. And when she found it, the coin, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. What rejoicing takes place? Jesus says that even God himself rejoices. Look at verse 7. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 just persons who need no repentance. Two ways of looking at those 99 just persons, by the way, uh, referring back to the sheep. Are these those who have previously come to the Lord and are saved? Or I think this is a reference back to the Pharisees and the, uh, and the scribes who are self-righteous in their own minds, thinking they need no repentance. Let us be careful not to number ourselves among the Pharisees and scribes. You know, I so easily do that, you know, I'm holier than thou. I go to church, I believe. I, I do all the right things, and, and I'm not like the scum that lives all around me. You know, Understand, that's the mindset of the Pharisees and scribes. But that's not how God looks at it. You see, the Pharisees and scribes, uh, they believe they're above all of that. But the Word tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 And God rejoices when a sinner repents. Let's look at verse 10. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. That expression, in the presence of the angels of God, who's in the presence of the angels of God? But God himself. God rejoices. How much joy have we brought into God's life by reaching out to those that are lost around us? You know, God searches, but he uses people. He uses you and I. You know, that's why he says, you shall be my witnesses. Go ye therefore into all the world and make disciples. We know the commands. There is rejoicing when God allows me to be present when an unsaved person comes and and to be present at the moment of their conversion at the moment of their regeneration what a time it is when we can experience that moment when God turns a heart and claims them as their own Uh, I, I have to be realistic there's been a number who have professed Christ and have come to Jesus in my presence and I rejoice over that but it wasn't because of what I did There have been many seeds planted, many people watering long before I came along. And then not only that, God used me to say the words, but it was God through His Holy Spirit that reached down and actually turned that heart, that turned that heart. And God allowed me to be there when it happened. And I praise God. And and what a joyful uh, thing that is. Uh, We have been charged with conveying his message of salvation called the gospel gospel means the good news the good news that you can be saved but it's God through his Holy Spirit that turns the heart and there is rejoicing in heaven all those who are lost needs to come to the Lord before it's too late 
and we know we don't need to look uh, far around us to know that the time is drawing short. There's going to come a time when Jesus comes again, and it will be too late. But we've got to have compassion for the lost. We have to have compassion for the lost. We must truly desire to, to bring joy to God. But, you know, the lost world around us is like a car accident. At the scene of a car accident, you've got the lost in the accident. And there are three groups of people around that accident. The first group is the bystanders and onlookers. They are curious as to watch and see what happens, but they have little active involvement. The second group are the police officers. They're quick. They assess the situation, and, and, and they investigate the cause of the accident. They assign blame, give out warnings, and assign punishment. The third group is the paramedics who arrive in the ambulance. They are the people usually the most welcomed at the scene by those involved in the accident. They could care less whose fault the accident is. They did not engage in lecturing about bad driving habits. Their response was to help those who hurt. They bandage the wounds. They free the trapped people. They give words of encouragement. What group do we find ourselves in? Actually, whether you like it or not, when it comes to reaching the loss, every one of us is part of one of those three groups. Maybe in one time in one group, and maybe time in another. But number one is uh, oftentimes we find ourselves uninvolved and we watch other people. We watch other people reach out. Number two, we're like the police and we want to condemn the wrongdoers. You're condemned and going to hell and you deserve it. Well, the fact is I deserve going to hell if I get right down to it. It's your fault you're in that mess. If you had been going to church like you should, this would have never happened. We often point. And then third, we could be those paramedics. We can make an effort to help those that are lost and hurting, taking care of their needs, bandaging their wounds, helping them along. I hope we will be in those showing compassion like those in that last group. You see, helping, helping hurting people can be pretty messy at times. It can be pretty messy getting involved in people's lives. And you know, and sometimes we're going to lose a few. As far as we know, we don't know if we planted seeds that somebody else is going to be able to reap later. But are we involved in helping those that we can, those that God has placed in our, uh, in our paths? And sometimes we need to go out and seek in, seeking after them. Some of the loss we can find right here within the church. You know, notice... Uh, notice in those two parables, the lost sheep. Where was the lost sheep? It was out there. Where was the coin lost? It was lost right inside the house. We have lost in our midst. Are we reaching out both within and without? We must reach both in the house and outside the house. The whole world is our mission field. From the church to our neighbors to school to work to our town to our state to our nation to the ends of the earth to the ends of the earth, you know. I might not be able to go to the ends of the earth, but we can at least send a shoebox. And there are many other ways. We must sound the warning. We must sound the warning because the time is drawing, is drawing down. The time is coming to a close. If you're here today and you have not, if you have not been found by God... And make no mistake, we don't find him. He finds us. He finds us. No one can go to him unless he calls us. And so if we hear that call. We hear that call, we can ignore it. If you've if you're been not been found yet, you can be found towards repentance towards him. We turn by godly sorrow. Interesting, Paul writes about godly sorrow. 
You see, godly sorrow is regretting, offending a most holy God. 2 Corinthians 7.10, Paul writes, he says, For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. That means I regret what I have done. I have hurt a holy God. I am turning towards him. He says, For godly sorrow produces repentance leading towards salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Worldly sorrow is, I'm sorry I got caught. Godly sorrow is turning towards him and allowing God to mold and shape us to his glory. Someone said about the church, I'm not sure who, who uh, I don't know who to attribute this quote to, but he said the church is the only organization that exists for the benefit of its non-members. Are we reaching out with the message that God has called us to, to a world that is lost and dying around us? We're going to sing a hymn here in a moment called The Potter's Hand. And, you know, the potter's hand molds us. And he puts us where he wants us to be. And he puts us so we're giving praise to him but as we're giving praise to him, we're influencing the world around us. We are being his witness. Next week, I'm going to talk about being bold in our witness. He has called us to be bold. He didn't call us just simply to sit and listen and to be trained. Uh, as I've mentioned before, I like the Nike commercial that says, just do it. Just do it. We worried about knowing enough or not knowing enough. When the call is clear, just do it. And we need to be witnesses to a lost world around us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We come before you humbled because none of us, not even me, we're not what you have called us to be. We're fall, failing every day when the opportunity has been clear. Lord, may we have the heart for the lost like you do, that you grieve, you take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Lord, may we be instrumental in your hands in turning the world towards you. Lord, this world needs, this nation, we need a great revival, but Lord, it can start right here. It can start right here in our midst. And Lord, may we be found faithful and just simply those everyday things that we already know that we ought to be doing, that we might be found doing it for you. Lord, use us today and move among us and touch us with your spirit, and may we feel your presence. May Jesus be glorified, for it's in his holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.